The producers of Freaks and Geeks had just finished up their casting process, hiring very talented young actors who would go on to do amazing things in the business. And one of those actors was cast because the producers, like Judd Apatow, thought he had a funny looking goofy face, but then soon realized that his uh, female co-workers did not think the same thing. Judd Apatow soon realized that he had a heartthrob on his hands. Judd Apatow had no idea that this was considered attractive. But that's how it went. Thus is the enigma that is James Franco. He allegedly has classic leading man good looks, but on the other hand, he's also a strange looking character actor. And James Franco has been able to be both of those things until relatively recently. For most performers, building up a resume of over 150 projects is something that takes an entire lifetime to achieve. But for James Franco, that is a feat that he has accomplished at just 45 years old. This freaky geek was catapulted to fame after appearing in one of the biggest comic book franchises of all time, before settling into his role as a performer who can take on any genre and any film, no matter how big or small. Like the guy would go back and forth between Hollywood franchise to freaky art house indie that nobody saw. One for them, one for him. One for them, one for him. And it's a beautiful thing. But with a tremendous rise at such a young age, sometimes you don't make the best decisions. And for James Franco, those bad decisions would come to light on the very night of his greatest professional achievement and begin a downfall that is sadly all too common in today's world. But now Franco has taken a back seat as allegations against him begin to pile up. So it's time we examine his career and find out just what the f**k happened to James Franco. But to truly understand what the f**k happened to James Franco, we must begin at the beginning of the beginning of the game when he was born on his birthday, 1978, California. When most people get into acting, they go in head first and start auditioning immediately. But James Franco knew that he wanted to study the craft before making a serious run at it. And so he spent a year and a half training and taking classes before he began auditioning. And maybe because of this, his first gig came rather quickly when he was cast in a Pizza Hut commercial before landing guest spots on shows like Pacific Blue and Profiler. But it would be in 1999 when James Franco and several other prominent stars of today had his true breakout role in a series that was canceled after airing just 12 episodes. So yeah, after having a supporting role in Never Been Kissed, James Franco would be cast as the bad boy in a short-lived yet cult classic TV series called Freaks and Geeks. The show premiered on September 25th, 1999 and received strong critical acclaim, yet only garnered around 7 million views, which in today's world would be actually a genuine hit, but in 1999 it was not very good. Despite the show's cancellation, James Franco, along with his castmates, would be nominated for Best Performance in a TV Series, Young Ensemble at the Young Artist Awards. But even with a failed TV series on his resume, James Franco was on the verge of something big. We don't often associate TNT made TV movies to be career makers, but James Franco, playing another actor named James, would be the big break he was looking for when he was cast as James Dean in James Dean. And yeah, he really looks like James Dean. I remember sitting there watching Spider-Man in the theaters and thinking to myself, wow, at certain angles, this guy looks like James Dean. And uh, yeah, I guess TNT thought the same. When cast as James Dean, James Franco took the job serious. He had never smoked before, but he became a two pack a day kind of guy, as James Dean was, while also learning to ride a motorcycle and play several instruments. He even isolated himself from his family and friends, saying that James Dean had this pervasive loneliness to him that he wanted to feel. That work would actually pay off 
when James Franco would be nominated for a Screen Actors Guild Award and an Emmy, while also winning Best Actor in a Motion Picture Made for TV at the 2002 Golden Globe Awards and the Critics' Choice Awards, too. Then came the year 2000, and James Franco would graduate to the world of blockbuster films when he went in to audition for the role of Peter Parker, aka Spider-Man, in a new film directed by Sam Raimi. Although he did not land the job as Peter, Sam Raimi thought James Franco was perfect to portray Peter Parker's best friend, who ultimately becomes his mortal enemy, Harry Osborn. Although there had been comic book films prior to this, Spider-Man can directly be attributed to the genre becoming what it has become today, I guess. Not only was it the first film to ever open above 100 million at the domestic box office, ultimately taking in 825 million worldwide. But that wasn't the only film you could see James Franco in in 2002. The guy works hard, as he had roles in Deuces Wild, City by the Sea, and a lead role in Nicolas Cage's directorial debut, Sunny. After appearing in the 2003 film The Company, James Franco would return to the world of blockbusters for the follow-up, Spider-Man 2, in 2004, a rare sequel that is widely regarded as superior to the original. With the mainstream success of the Spider-Man films, James Franco would land leading roles in films such as The Great Raid, Tristan and Isolde, Annapolis, and Flyboys. The problem was that none of these films really hit it at the box office. James Franco would then pop up in a series of small roles and cameos in such films as Wicker Man, The Dead Girl, The Holiday, An American Crime, and Knocked Up. However, Franco's biggest success or achievement, although the numbers and reviews may not support that claim, was when he decided to step behind the camera and make his directorial debut with the 2005 film The Ape, which has nothing to do with Rise of the Planet of the Apes, but I like to pretend it does. Some critics did call this film self-indulgent, and it never received a theatrical release, but it did start James Franco down a path of directing, which some say he has certainly gotten better as time went on. Back on the big screen, James Franco would finally go full villain with Spider-Man 3, when the arc of his character was complete and become the new Green Goblin. But for James Franco, I just think he wasn't super comfortable in those big blockbusters. He's more of an indie kind of guy. He would finish out 2007 starring opposite Tommy Lee Jones in The Valley of Law, and then he went and did something kind of strange, but you know, that's so James Franco. So yeah, by this time, James Franco was a pretty big star, so it was a bit of a shock when he decided to head back to TV. But not just any TV, daytime soap opera TV, when he appeared in over 30 episodes of the long-running General Hospital playing a character named Franco. In 2008, after appearing in the romantic comedy Camille, Franco would re-team with Judd Apatow and Seth Rogen, his freaks and geeks buddies, for the film Pineapple Express, where he played a marijuana-smoking drug dealer of marijuana. This R-rated film would be a much-needed success for James Franco, pulling in over $100 million off a $20 million budget, with James Franco being awarded the High Times Stoner of the Year Award, as well as being nominated for a Golden Globe. Then James Franco would appear in the critically acclaimed film Milk, where he played a much younger lover to the San Francisco politician Harvey Milk, played by Sean Penn. In this movie, you get to watch Sean Penn make out with James Franco, and it's not awkward at all. James Franco said that it was a dream come true to work with filmmaker Gus Van Zandt, saying that he used to watch Drugstore Cowboy in my own private Idaho obsessively. Of course, with James Franco, you never really know what you're gonna get, and he would kick off 2010 by starring as Allen Ginsberg in the independent film Howl, which would see James Franco nominated for several awards. He would follow that up with a comical turn in the film Date Night, before starring in the little scene Shadows and Lies and he was even in Eat, Pray, Love, while directing a documentary called Saturday Night about the production process of Saturday Night Live. The dude is always working. Of course, 2010 was also the year James Franco was seen in the true story, 127 Hours, as a guy who has to cut off his arm. That's the whole movie, a guy cutting off his arm. But you know what? It's actually frickin' brilliant. 
because of James Franco's performance and the direction of Danny Boyle. This would see him receive several nominations, including an Academy Award for Best Lead Actor. And although he did not win the Oscar, nominee James Franco would also step foot on the stage as the host of the Oscars that evening alongside Anne Hathaway. But sadly, that year, a year in which James Franco gave his best performance ever in 127 hours, it wouldn't be the film that people were talking about the next day, but the absolutely cringy, horrible job he did hosting the show. But I don't really think it was his fault. He was doing his James Franco thing. Why would anyone hire him to do this? He mixes up his output from independent character studies that go under the radar to films that grab the attention of the critics to blockbuster films aimed at the popcorn-eating crowd alongside some solid comedies thrown in for good measure. But it isn't even his name above the title that keeps him going. He's happy to just show up in a cameo in his friend's projects without receiving any credit, as we've seen already. Since 2011, he has had no less than two films released each year, with some years seeing up to 12 projects featuring the actor. Whether he has a small cameo in his former best friend Seth Rogen's Green Hornet, or if he's starring in the horribly misguided comedy Your Highness, which should have been the next Pineapple Express, but it wasn't, because it's stupid and completely missed the point of everything. And he did all this while also launching a very lucrative franchise reboot starring as a human in Rise of the Planet of the Apes. Then the next year he shows up in a film called The Iceman while playing an arms dealer who takes some unsuspecting young ladies under his wing in Harmony Kareem's Spring Breakers, where he was definitely trying something. Then he would appear on the Nick at Night telenovela Hollywood Nights, while appearing alongside Winona Ryder in The Letter, to playing Hugh Hefner in Lovelace, followed by reuniting with Sam Raimi to play the man behind the curtain in Oz the Great and Powerful, which I didn't like. And I don't think uh, a lot of other people liked it too, so James Franco would then again step behind the camera for As I Lay Dying, before starring in one of the funniest meta movies ever where actors play themselves I guess and they do it freaking perfectly in this one this one's called this is the end where James Franco plays James Franco and he's really really good at playing James Franco whoever James Franco may be and this film this is the end shows that despite James Franco being in like very very intense dramas He's also an extremely talented comedic actor as well. Even though I think Seth Rogen said that sometimes James Franco needs like a lot of takes, but then he finally nails it. And when he nails it, it's perfect. He would finish out 2013 by directing three more films, Palo Alto, Child of God, and the documentary Interior Leather Bar while also appearing in Third Person and Homefront, and of course he got the dubious honor of being roasted by his closest friends in the Comedy Central Roast of James Franco. He would also receive a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. In 2014, he would take a bit of a break by appearing in an episode of Naked and Afraid before playing himself on Veronica Mars, the movie, followed by starring in Good People, while directing and starring in The Sound of Fury, before almost bringing the United States to war with North Korea for the film The Interview. That's right, a James Franco Seth Rogen film almost created an international conflict. Because you know, movies have the power to change the world. For better or worse, 2005 would be his big year. 12 movies featuring the actor were released. Granted, most were independent and direct-to-video releases, but all showcased the range of Franco. Whether it was in the adaptation of Don Quixote, to playing a man suspected of killing his family in True Story, alongside titles such as Yosemite, I Am Michael, Queen of the Desert, Everything Will Be Fine, Wild Horses, The Heyday of the Insensitive Bastards, The Adderall Diaries, Memoria, while voicing the fox in The Little Prince, and having another hilarious cameo as himself in the R-rated Christmas comedy The Night Before, while also appearing in the Hulu series Deadbeat. 
Franco is a performer that never seems to slow down. Between 2016 and 2015, he appeared in no less than 28 projects, including Sausage Party, Why Him, The Show, Ken, The Coen Brothers' The Ballad of Buster Scruggs, where he became a meme with his first time joke, and the TV series Angie Tribeca while also appearing in and directing episodes of the hit miniseries 11-22-63, which was a Stephen King JFK thriller, and The Deuce, while also directing the films In Dubious Battle, The Institute, Future World, The Pretenders, and Zeroville. Of course, his biggest success at that time came when he directed a film about the making of a film that has been deemed the worst movie ever made, The Disaster Artist. This film would bring James Franco the respect he had longed for as a director. It would be a film that would be praised not just for the direction, but for his pitch-perfect portrayal of the room star Tommy Wiseau. On January 7th, 2018, James Franco would take the stage at the Beverly Hilton, where the 75th Annual Golden Globe Awards were happening to accept his award for Best Actor in a Comedy. That night, he was sporting a pin on his lapel in solidarity with the fight against sexual misconduct. At the moment he took the stage, James Franco was experiencing perhaps the biggest high of his entire career. But what he didn't know is that, at that exact moment, a former co-star of his, Ali Sheedy, whom James Franco directed and appeared in, an off-Broadway play in 2014. Ali Sheedy tweeted that, James Franco just won. Please never ask me why I left the TV film business. That mysterious tweet led to James Franco admitting to texting and trying to meet up with a 17-year-old girl. Franco blamed the incident on the trickiness of social media, while saying he exercised bad judgment. Franco would appear on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert just three days after, where Colbert asked the actor about these allegations, and him wearing the pin in the face of the allegations. Franco said that he had no idea what he did to Ali Sheedy, while also saying that other allegations made against him were not accurate. Of course, those allegations were just the beginning. A month after winning the award, the Los Angeles Times published a report where five women accused James Franco of exploiting his power to seduce these women into unwanted sexual encounters while he was a teacher at the Playhouse West Acting School and his own Stage 4 school in Los Angeles, where the women said that James Franco took advantage of their desire to be a part of the film industry. Other women alleged that James Franco would convince these young women to perform sexual acts in his films, with the thought that it would help their careers. In 2019, two of these women sued James Franco for sexualizing his power as a teacher and employer by dangling potential roles in his projects in their face. Although James Franco maintained his innocence, he would reach a $2.2 million settlement in 2021 and admit that he did abuse his power by engaging in consensual sexual encounters with his students. He said that he started the school with the intention of helping students fulfill their dreams of being in show business, and not of some sort of sick plan to sleep with women. But he figured that if these sexual relationships with his students were consensual, then it was okay. Not exactly recognizing the power dynamic between the award-winning professional actor and those young women who were still trying to make their way in the industry. And it would seem that these bad decisions made by James Franco have taken a toll on his career. As you can tell, Franco was the very definition of a working actor. The dude was constantly working. Every year since his first project in 1997, James Franco had something on TV or in theaters all the frickin' time. This was a person who genuinely loves working in the entertainment industry and would give it 100% whether it was a big budget summer blockbuster role or a soap opera. And since winning that Golden Globe and the allegations against him, he has appeared on several podcasts where he talks about his addiction issues to both alcohol and sex. 
Franco actually does have a few films in the pipeline, including a film where he plays Fidel Castro. But the real question is, will James Franco ever get back to where he once was? It seems even James Franco's closest friends have not stuck by him during this time. When Seth Rogen said that he has no plans to ever work with James Franco again. But in a world where people like Louis C.K. can continue to sell out their live performances, it seems like talented people can have resurrections in their career. It seems like being cancelled isn't exactly, uh, final and fatal all the time. So yeah, unlike the cancelling of freaks and geeks, James Franco may very well come back. And James Franco, he seems to genuinely show remorse for his actions, I guess. Or he's a really good actor, but y you know, get that Miss Doubtfire conundrum there. But yeah, the dude has proven to be an immense talent, and it's not unthinkable that we will see James Franco in the limelight again. Just as long as he never hosts the Oscars, please. So yeah, that's what the fuck happened to James Franco. Uh, yeah, he's not exactly doing fine, but uh, yeah.